All right. So my name is Karen Jensen. I'm the director here at the Blackstone Library. I wanted to extend a very warm welcome to the New Haven Preservation Trust, Ms. Jenny Schofield and Mr. Christopher Weigren, as they present their program, Visions and Vistas, Olmstead and the Landscaping of New Haven County. We are also pleased to welcome you all to this magnificent auditorium at the Blackstone Library. This program was made possible in part because of our friend, John Hosean, who was a member of the building committee uh, that guided our recent renovation. John is a resident of Brantford, and as many of you know, he served as the New Haven Preservation Trust's Preservation Services Officer for 15 years. He's passionate about history and architecture. He's been so generous in sharing his knowledge and expertise with all of us at the library. It's been my absolute privilege to work with him on our renovation project. And now I will turn the podium over to John who will introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. It was my pleasure to work on the building committee. I had a blast. Um, anyway, uh, Daniel H. Burnham, the prominent Chicago planner and architect of the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition set of Olmsted, he paints with lakes and wooded slopes, with lawns and banks and forest covered hills, with mountainsides and ocean views. I love that quote because he really was an artist. Connecticut has a unique association with Frederick Law Olmsted the father of American landscape architecture. He was born and laid to rest in Hartford, Connecticut. Inspired by the 200th anniversary of Olmsted's birth, the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office and Preservation Connecticut <clears throat> teamed together to complete a statewide survey and history of the Olmsted firm's work and influence in Connecticut. With us to share some of the project's findings are Jenny Schofield, National Register and Architectural Survey Coordinator at the State Historic Preservation Office, and Christopher Wiegren, <coughs> Deputy Director of Preservation Connecticut, the statewide nonprofit dedicated to preserving and promoting the building sites and landscapes that contribute to the vitality of Connecticut. Ms. Schofield's primary role with the state is to help Connecticut communities identify places important in history and to work creatively to promote their stewardship. She is a certified planner with a master's degree, with master's degrees in urban planning and historic preservation. Um, she has also worked as a cultural resource consultant for over 15 years before joining the State Historic Preservation Office. Mr. Wiegren's main responsibilities include editing Preservation Connecticut's wonderful newsletter and managing its preservation easements and awards programs. He holds a master's degree in architectural history and is the author of Connecticut Architecture, Stories of a Hundred Places. In addition, he serves on the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Board and the Merritt Parkway Advisory Committee. Please welcome Jenny Schofield and Christopher Wiegren. Okay, can you hear? Yeah. To bring this way down. <laughs> Thank you for having us this morning. We're excited to share our project with you. So as John mentioned, um, Frederick Law Olmsted Sr., who you all know as a uh, famous national figure, the father of American landscape design or landscape architecture, um, is pretty well known. <laughs> And there's a lot of projects going on right now to celebrate Olmsted 200, which is the bicentennial of Olmsted Senior's birthday, which was this past April. Um, but our project was inspired because a lot of people don't know about Connecticut's very special, special connection to this national figure and our role in the creation of um, the landscape design field. So as John mentioned, um, Olmsted Sr. was born here, he's buried here, and he gets a lot of his uh, foundational experiences 
in the Connecticut landscape and on Connecticut's farms and in the River Valley. So all the way back in 2017, um, both Chris's office and my office started to talk with the National Association of Homestead Parks about how Connecticut's role in this national, um, the national development of landscape design was not really well documented. And as the National Association of Olmsted Parks started to plan um, a series of events to celebrate Olmsted's birthday, we started to plan a project to um, better recognize Olmsted here. Um, so, and it, it's um, rather unique. It's a, a true partnership between both the state governmental office for preservation, which is my office, and the statewide nonprofit. Um, and we do partner a lot, but um, we had an opportunity on this particular project to really do a project together um, and reach more people with the information. Um, so one of the goals of the project was to highlight um, Olmsted Firm's connection here, but another role was to create a better understanding of landscapes as historic resources um, provide more information and resources about that and kickstart a more robust program of landscape stewardship in Connecticut. Um, and just there's a map on the screen, which you know, may be a little hard to see, but all those little dots are mapped um, by the Fairstead site up uh, in Massachusetts. And that's representing the 6,000 projects of the Olmsted firm. Um, completed between 1857 and 1979 when the legacy firms stopped. Um, so in terms of historic resources, historic properties, we've always appreciated our landscapes here in Connecticut, but nationally it takes a little while to understand that some of the setting, some of the environment that we're standing in is actually a historic resource in itself. So in terms of um, traditional means of documenting these places, landscapes don't get a lot of attention until, until about the 1990s. Um, 1978 is the Alliance for Historic Landscape Preservation, which is an international group of professionals. That's their founding, and that's sort of the first time that landscapes um, come onto the national scene, aside from the uh, generation of um, national parks. So you see sort of this timeline of some of the dates of major landscape stewardship entities that exist. Um, and here in Connecticut, um, we started to document landscapes through the uh, Preservation Connecticut's Town Green Survey in the 1990s. We started to, started to study our municipal parks and also, um, saw the establishment of the Merritt Parkway Conservancy and uh, National Register nomination. So why is it important um, to recognize landscapes for their historic value? Um, my answer to that is it's the same for any resource, is that you can't care for it properly if you don't fully understand what is there if you don't recognize that it's there and you don't fully understand um, all of the physical features of that place that's, that's giving you that feeling that you feel when you're there. Um, so here's an example, uh, Chase Park in Waterbury. This is a, a large park designed by the Olmsted firm um, that became the site of our highway. <laughs> so this is one of the, the edges of the park and this is what that looks like today. Clearly when the highway was constructed, there was no appreciation for the value of that park um, or it was outweighed by the um, need to build the highway. So here's Chase Park. Um, here's the Olmsted Brothers plan from 1920. Um, if you look at the river crossings, you can kind of match up the maps. Um, but you'll see Olmsted, the park as it was built in 1934 in the middle. And then you're looking at the same location of the park, how it is now. Um, so when we're documenting historic landscapes, 
We wanna be able to communicate what's important about it. Why do we care about it? How does it make us feel when we're in it? Uh, what are the physical features that contribute to that? And it's also important to understand that landscapes can be designed or they might be vernacular. They might be everyday spaces that have a certain feeling to them. Um, and they, there can be components of that landscape that are important from different time periods. So it's not always the original design. Sometimes original designs or concepts aren't actually built that way, um, often due to funding or, or some of these wishes don't align with the designer's wishes. Um, so it's important to understand what actually got built and what are the critical pieces of that landscape and from what date. Um, and one thing we want to avoid too when you're managing a landscape is to remove a later alteration that might actually have its own importance. You don't necessarily have to restore everything back to the original concept. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about what we're looking at in this survey. So I'll back up a moment and explain that our project is a statewide history of the Olmsted's firm work, firm's work in Connecticut. So the whole firm from Olmsted and Elliot through the brothers, all the way up through um, the latest iterations of the firm. We're doing a, a history that is focused on Connecticut and how Connecticut plugs in to the Olmsted firm's work and to the characteristics of the Olmsted firm's design that are known nationally. And then we've surveyed um, a good chunk of the properties that the Olmsted firm designed. So I'm going to explain a little bit about the type of information we've been collecting this survey. And then Chris Wiegren is going to go into more detail about what actually are the Olmsted firm's characteristics and how are those represented in New Haven County. Um, so here's an example of our survey form. Um, this is notable for us because we haven't ever had a uh, landscape survey form. So we survey buildings all the time and other types of resources, but we haven't had a document that is specific to landscapes and the type of information you would want to know about a landscape. Um, this is a survey form that we expect could be used for any type of landscape, not just the Olmsted firm going forward. So as people are doing regular architectural surveys, they could be filling out landscape forms as well. Um, so it's a little bit hard to see, but there's um, the type of landscape. Is it designed or vernacular? Is it agricultural? Is it linear? Um, who designed it? And when we say designer, it's not always just a landscape architect. It might be a gardener, a maintenance person, um, a property owner who contributed to the design. Um, and there's some information here collecting about what type of environment that it's in. So is it urban setting? Is it, you know, which sort of um, geological region of Connecticut is it in? What kind of natural drainage or slope does that property have? Um, and then uh, we focus a lot on some characteristics or qualities of that place that are um, called the visual assessment summary. Um, and the items in this list are based on the National Park Service Cultural Landscape Inventory, which is something that the National Park Service developed in the 1990s in order to understand their own landscapes that they had within the national park system. Um, so I'll just go through a couple of these. Is it's helpful when you're standing in a place and you're thinking about, okay, I, I really like this place. What is it about it? What do I need to pay attention to? Um, what's maybe not so important? Um, so one of the um, qualities we're looking at is the layout of a place and the spatial relationships between things. Um, if there are buildings or trees, you know, where are those placed? How close together are they? Um, are you, are you getting, um, linear views or paths or formal paths or are you getting curvilinear um, places or places without defined edges. 
Um, again, Chris is going to talk about some of these projects in more detail, but this is an example of a subdivision designed by the Olmsted Brothers where they um, added these uh, curvilinear streets into what was previously a more regular grid. And one of the um, spatial qualities they were trying to achieve was a village-like feel with easy access to a green. So even though you were near a factory, you're in a rural feeling place in your neighborhood. Um, so in addition to the spatial arrangements, the Olmsted firm works a lot with topography. So in any type of landscape, um, you can look at, is the topography natural? Has it been manipulated? Um, you know, is there variation in the slope of that place or um, are the natural geological formations? So boulders, cliff bases, um, is that used in any way? Um, so here's an example where it's a little more formal of a landscape. Um, this is Edric, Edward Clark Whiting and the long, uh, landscape firm designing uh, terraces and gardens uh, at an estate. Um, and when you think about spatial relationships, another um, note for the Olmsted firm in a lot of places is, are there different places in one landscape for different purposes? So is there a separation of use or are there sort of defined places with different characteristics um, that are meant for, for more passive recreation or more active recreation? In this case, you know, you have some open lawn, you have some special plantings, and then you have some more formal gardens. Um, so here we are. <laughs> It's uh, debated whether Olmsted plan was actually implemented here at the library, but um, another feature that we're looking at is plantings. Um, a big characteristic um, for the Olmsted firm is specimen trees. And if that is a term that means nothing to you, it's basically like the fad we had in current interior design to have a focal wall you know, the wall that you paint a different color. <laughs> you want a focal point in a room. Uh, it used to be a, a fireplace with a nice mantle. Um, you'll see a lot of large trees that are focal points in a landscape. It's meant to draw your eye or to add to the feeling. And they are usually chosen um, because they have a certain shape or texture or color that is appealing in that place. Um, at Waterbury Hospital, there are some specimen trees planted along the approach that was meant to give you a peaceful feeling as you approach the hospital. So uh, it's meant to um, help with recovery and, and peacefulness. Um, and then you can also see that they worked with uh, um, natural topography and, and worked around the geological features there. Okay. Um, so two more characteristics here. One big one is views. Um, in landscape world, there's planning for both views, which is a sweeping view, a broad view. You know, what can you see in the range of your eye? And then there's also something called a vista point, which is a, a very controlled manicured point where you, you come to a place, you're standing in a place and you have a very specific view. You may not realize it, <laughs> but landscape designers are very carefully editing what's around you so that you have these different experiences and you come to a certain viewpoint. Um, so here's an obvious one at Tranquility Farm where you're standing basically on a, a patio and you're looking to this beautiful sweeping view of, of Lake Quasi Club. Sometimes it's a little more subtle than that, where you could be on the Appalachian Trail and there just happens to be a place where you can get to an overlook and you're seeing something, or it might be a more intimate view, um, a more closed in view, not a broad sweeping view, but you're looking at a particular feature like a bridge or a river. Um, so that's something to pay attention to when you're looking at historic landscape. 
as well as the use of water features. Um, you know, is there a river, is there a fountain, is there a coastline, a lake? Uh, how are you interacting with that? What's your view of that? And then um, also, how is drainage handled? Um, where is the water running off? Is that done in an obvious or you know, visible way, scenic way? Is that at the edge? Is that in the middle? Um, and also, if you're in a more public space like a park, um, how are the edges of that place treated? So in the case of Fulton Park, um, there's this, there's lots of water features. There's um, drainage, there's a stream sort of trickling through the edge, but the water is meant to run off into that. Um, and they also, even though this is in Waterbury um, with multifamily housing all around it, in many places of the park, um, the edges of the park are softened a bit. So you don't have this sort of hard line between the park and the density that's outside of it. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Chris in, the mo in a moment, but I just wanted to share um, what we found out about Connecticut in terms of Olmstead work. So um, there are 298 projects that were given a job number. Um, Chris can explain more, but usually any time the Olmsted had correspondence about something, they filed it and they gave it a job number. <laughs> so not all those things were actually done, but for Connecticut, we have 298. Um, as far as we can tell so far, and these are still kind of draft numbers, but as far as we can tell about 226 of those were actually um, completed by the Olmsted firm. Um, we so far have surveyed about 131. Um, and all the different colors that you're seeing here represent different types of landscapes. So there's um, subdivisions, cemeteries, campuses, grounds of different places. So residential grounds, institutional grounds. Um, and the National Park Service over several years has categorize those and made 14 different categories. So they're able to map, um, you know, where are the monuments, where are the burial places. Um, and there are a couple of different national maps like this. Um, we're also mapping the properties we've surveyed and we're trying to do that with, with extreme accuracy. So we'll actually have a point that is on the correct parcel so that we know where things are. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Chris to tell you more about what's in New Haven County. Thanks. It's delightful to be here, although I can't help but think Frederick Law Olmsted might say, why are you inside looking at pictures of landscapes <laughs> on a day like this when you can be outdoors in a landscape? <laughs> I'm gonna talk about some of the results uh, from our survey in New Haven County. Um, as Jenny said, it, it's still preliminary. Um, some more research is being done, some more drafts are being reviewed, uh, but this is uh, at least some of the things that we're seeing in the county so far. And because, of the two parts of the project, the, the background history and then the individual site surveys. Um, we're looking at sort of two kinds of places. Uh, ones that you might call biography, places that relate to Frederick Law Olmsted's uh, youth, uh, upbringing, education, people he knew, people who influenced him, places that influenced him in Connecticut, and then so that the, the shape, helped shape the, his work and, and the work of the firm continuing afterwards. And then the other is the actual landscape designs. So um, some of the, leg there are some of these, what we're referring to as legacy sites in New Haven County. Uh, one is in Cheshire, uh, the farm that was owned by Frederick Law Olmsted's uncle, um, and that Fred and his brother John visited frequently when they were growing up. Uh, they walked there from Hartford 
to Cheshire um, uh, when they were about 10 years old. <laughs> and, you know, it's been a couple of weeks, um, but this was a big active farm. It is still owned by descendants of Olmsted's uncle. They have a lot of family papers and records. Um, and uh, there's even a little clump of hemlock trees that Frederick is supposed to have planted um, a dozen years before he got involved with Central Park. So even before he became a landscape designer, he was looking at landscape, he was planting trees at his uncle's farm. His education was very irregular. He was farmed out to uh, various ministers and schoolmasters and tutors in various places around the state. He spent a couple of years in North Guilford being, when he was very young, you know, six, seven, eight years old, uh, being taught by the minister in North Guilford and living at the parsonage, which is still there in North Guilford. Um, he never went to college, uh, but um, his brother went to Yale. They had a relative who taught at Yale, and Fred spent a lot of time at Yale, meeting people, uh, attending a few classes, reading, making some lifelong friendships um, that got him that later show up in the in the firm work product. Um, so and um, so that's you know another L element to it. Um, and then actual farming. He, he worked for a while on a farm in Waterbury. And then um, he, his father bought him a farm at Sagem's Head in Guilford. Uh, he was interested in scientific farming, putting you know, scientific principles to work and making farming better. Um, the land wasn't very good at Sagem's Head and he didn't stay there very long. He moved, moved on to Staten Island. But these are some of the kinds of places that affected Olmsted's work and the work of the Olmsted firm. So those are the, those are the biography places. Um, and then for the landscapes themselves, here, here are some stats. Um, 69 job numbers, as Jenny mentioned, project files. And sometimes there's just some correspondence. Dear Mr. Olmsted, how much will it cost to, uh, for you to landscape my estate? Uh, dear Mr. Griswold, well, um, that depends on how big it is and how much you want us to do. Uh, we'll come out and make a visual, you know, make a trip for $100 plus traveling costs. End of file. <laughs> you know, so, and then, or then they're the ones where they actually do make a design and then the um, price sticker shock hits the, the client and nothing is done. Or the sticker shock hits the client and uh, it's done, but only part of it's ever done. Um, so there, there are degrees of, of, of work that are carried out. Um, but you know, of those 69 job numbers, nine of them from Frederick Law Olmsted's lifetime, and then um, the rest from later, later in the career and the work of the firm. 34 of those we've surveyed for, this, for the Olmsted project. Six again from Olmsted's lifetime. And 25 of those we, we've rated as recognizable. There's something there that you can look at and you can see this is a historic landscape created by the Olmsted firm. It may not be entirely intact. It may be just bits and pieces uh, like um, you saw Chase Park there in Waterbury, uh, but uh, on quite a number of them, there, there's still much more that you can see. And then you can see some of the types. We've got campus plans, cemeteries, estates, parks, grounds for hospitals, grounds for public buildings, one church, private residences, subdivisions, city, one city plan. So it, there's a variety of kinds of work. Um, the, the overall work product of the Olmsted firm is categorized into 14 different types and 13 of those are found in Connecticut. So you, they did a lot of stuff here. Um, before we get much farther, here, here are the Olmsteads. Frederick Law Olmsted, the founder of the firm and, and really the, the founder of landscape architecture. Uh, that's even a term that he invented um, in America. He um, really gets started with the Central Park in New York uh, design in 1857. Um, he retires in 1895 due to failing health. Um, the firm is continued by his this is where things get complicated. His two sons, only one of his sons is his nephew who becomes his adopted son, who becomes his stepson. Um, <laughs> John Charles is the son of Olmsted's uh, brother, John. 
uh, brother John died and Olmsted married John's widow. Um, and so, uh, it, and then, so John Charles uh, be, starts off as nephew, becomes stepson, and is actually adopted as son. So he and Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. continue to run the firm as Olmsted brothers. Um, John Charles dies in 1920, Frederick Jr. dies in 1957, um, and I Shortly after that, Olmsted Brothers becomes Olmsted Associates and continues to operate until 1979 when it's shut down. And the Olmsted site in Brookline, Massachusetts is given to the National Park Service in 1980, along with all the records, or a lot of the records anyway. They've got rooms and rooms of them. Uh, many of them are available online, but not everything. So obviously over the course of 120 some years, uh, the nature of landscape architecture changes, um, changing times, changing client desires, changing fashions, um, but there's a lot that remains uh, uniform through the firm's practice as well. So we're gonna look at some of the sites, um, starting with where we are right now, the Blackstone Library. Um, there's not a lot of material available online. There are five drawings. Um, we didn't have access to any of the correspondence, so it's a bit hard to tell exactly how much they were. Um, but the file starts off with this drawing of the plans for a building. Um, doesn't quite look like this building, does it? It's, it looks like three buildings, a library and an auditorium, and then what seems to be a librarian's residence. They're connected in a straight line by a um, car colonnade. And the drawing is signed by Henry Ives Cobb, an architect in Chicago. So, um, and if you know, how many of you know anything about the history of this building? Have you ever heard of Henry Ives Cobb in relation to it? No, you haven't. <laughs> so um, here's a, there, there are several site plans in the file. They all look pretty much like this. This is the most finished one. So you've got that three building complex, only it's been bent a little bit to, to face the corner rather than to face straight out onto Main Street. Um, and they've added some things. Um, you can see those, the house and then behind the house and the auditorium, there are a couple of things labeled shed. I assume that means carriage sheds. Um, there's a laundry yard and a service yard marked out. So they're thinking about not only, you know, where do you put the building and what kind of trees you plant around it, they're thinking about provisions for things like service and laundry and carriage parking. Um, so that, um, you know, that this is part of a landscape architect's brief. Um, and then we have the building as it was built today a different design by a different architect, Solon Beeman, um, but he's also from Chicago where the donor lived. Um, but a couple of elements seem to survive from that original layout. Um, you, there are some similarities to Ives', to, um, Ives's uh, plan, uh, the curved edges, the rotunda, the dome suggesting a circular space, that, that same as that other drawing had. Um, and from the Olmsted work, you've got the idea still of the building facing diagonally towards the corner uh, rather than straight out onto Main Street. So that I think the idea is as if you're coming up the street from, um, from East Haven, you know, you're going to see more of the front of the building and not the side of it uh, that it faces there. So that's um, the, the plants I just found out this morning, uh, a lot of the plantings that you see outside now uh, date to much later in the 20th century to a local enthusiast for exotic plants. And it's interesting to walk around and read all the tree, the trees that are labeled with it's coming from uh, Korea, and Japan and China. Uh, so very exotic plantings out there, uh, much simpler, couple of elm trees and um, grass around the building in this early postcard. So parks uh, are obviously uh, a very important part of the Olmsted firm's work, starting with Central Park in New York, um, always a mainstay. Waterbury has three interesting Olmsted firm parks, all from later in the, in the firm's practice. Um, Fulton Park is very much what you think of when you think of an Olmsted Park. A large 
urban space in, in the middle of a city, but um, looking very naturalistic, um, pastoral with open lawns and trees singly or in small clumps dotted around it. Um, it's a very peaceful kind of landscape, uh, gentle slopes. Um, and as I say, not, not a lot of not a lot of, of stuff to look at, you know, built things in it. Uh, and this is in keeping with the idea that Frederick Law Olmsted promoted from the very first, that, that parks are places where you go to experience nature, to be refreshed and revivified, to sort of escape from the stresses and strains of urban life. Um, and that just by walking through a beautiful natural landscape, it sort of works subconsciously on you to rest your spirit, to refresh you, to refresh you in, inwardly. Um, and that's what Olmsted is aiming at in a lot of his park designs. So, um, so you can see sort of how that was shaped originally at the main entry to the park and then how it looks today. Um, by 1920, that sort of passive recreation walk through a beautiful landscape uh, aspect of park design was, was continuing, but there also was a lot more interest in active recreation in ball fields and other uh, places for organized sports and activities. And so what the firm tended to do would be to I put those in a separate area of, of the park to sort of have a, a kind of zoning. So you've got a separation of uses. And at Fulton Park, you've got Playing, playing fields, as you see on the left here, still with trees and that kind of rustic stone stairs to get down to the, to the field. Uh, but that's one end of the park. And then the, the rest of the park is that more naturalistic, passive recreation kind of landscape. Another park in Waterbury is called the Hayden Homestead Park. Uh, it's a much smaller park. It's only about three acres. Um, no active recreation, it's all passive recreation, but it's got a couple of different kinds of landscape. It's really set up on a hill and you have to climb up a steep hill from the street to get to the main open area of the park, which you see on the left here. Um, again, open lawn, uh, dotted trees around it. Um, so it's again, that pastoral landscape, a very peaceful, calm, soothing uh, atmosphere that the firm is known for. But to get up there, to go up that steps, you've got a different sort of experience. You've got that narrow path on the right, which is very densely planted, and it's got a very steep hillside, so there's almost an element of danger there. Am I going to fall off the edge and go tumbling down the hill? Um, and while it's thickly planted, you can sort of look between the trees and you can look out and you can see views toward, toward the city of, of Waterbury downtown. So there's a bit more drama to it. And this is what Olmsted called picturesque, uh, irregular, richly, densely planted, um, got a more drama and movement and, and, and perhaps even a hint of danger and, uh, to it. So that, that's picturesque landscape to Olmsted. It's not quite as the same kind of restful landscape. And as I said, there's, there's, you have to get up the hill. So there's a, a map of the park and you can see on the lower right, sort of the lower part and bending around to the right, all those contour lines that are very close together, showing you how steep the climb is. And there's the main approach with a stair that goes straight up, um, rather steep, but it's got some landings to give you a moment to catch your breath. Uh, lots of trees and shrubs on either side. So again, it's kind of closed in and, and shady and dark, but then you can see the daylight at the top. So you can see that there's some light, there's some openness up there and that's sort of going to draw you up the stair. Uh, or you can take the roadway that curves around to the right. Um, that's, uh, and, and that's wider, it's, it's more gentle and you don't see where it's going. It's got a curve in it. So, so there's a bit of mystery there uh, that you want to draw, you want to explore, you want to see what, what happens. How do, what happens when you go around that corner? How do you get to the top? Um, and if you go halfway up the steps, then you go off to the left is that other little narrow path that I showed you. So that um, the one with the, the rocks lining the edge and the 
steep drop off. So in this one little park, you've got three ways of making the same journey from the bottom to the top. You've got two kinds of landscapes. You've really packed a lot of experiences into this small space and they're all very carefully thought out. The third park in Waterbury is Library Park. So that's downtown, right next to City Hall. It's the setting for the City Library. Um, and the, here the firm actually collaborated with Cass Gilbert, who was the architect of City Hall. Um, and he modified the design for the gazebo there on the edge of the park. Um, and again, this is one of those simpler landscapes. It's basically a big lawn with some trees around the edges, uh, a brick wall sort of forming a retaining wall because the land drops off. Um, and that provides a place for a lot of activities. Um, historically, you know, that's been a place where you could have concerts and festivals and things. And that's another aspect of parks, beginning with Frederick Law Olmsted, is that there are places for people to gather for all segments of society that to have access to and have access to together. And he sees this as a way of strengthening democracy, of strengthening the cohesion of the society in the city where everybody is there. They're interacting together, they're meeting each other, they're perhaps getting to know each other, um, to see each other and aware of each other and aware of the need uh, of, of all the people of the city to take care of themselves, of, of each other. So the New Haven Trust, I'm gonna look at a few jobs, especially in New Haven, uh, which begin with a citywide plan that Frederick Law Olmsted and Cass Gilbert, the architect from Waterbury, uh, he's a New York architect, but, but he worked in Waterbury, uh, had created a citywide plan for the city of New Haven in 1910. Um, the best known aspect of that is what you see here. It's a pro proposal for a grand boulevard that would connect the railroad station to the New Haven Green downtown. Before that, there was no simple way to get from one to the other. So you were arriving in the city and you're kind of left on your own to figure out how to get downtown. Um, this was obviously never built, um, but it's become kind of famous as, as one of those what ifs in uh, Connecticut architectural history. Um, a lot of the influence of this may be from the Macmillan plan for the mall in Washington, DC where Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. had been a part of the committee that created that. Uh, really still young in his career. He was only about 30 when that commission was done. And he was working with people of his father's generation, uh, Charles McKim, Daniel Burnham, uh, and others. So um, that really got planning into his blood. And planning becomes an important part of the firm's work um, in a larger scale. And, Equally important, besides the Grand Bazaar Boulevard in downtown New Haven, the city plan makes a lot, spends a lot of time talking about recommendations for parks and open space and making sure that there's a distribution of open space throughout the city, not just in a few places, so that all citizens can get to parkland fairly easily. Uh, either by developing new parks or expanding and improving existing parks. And as you can see, the firm uh, then did work on several parks in New Haven. And we're gonna look at a few of them. Um, beginning with the New Haven Green. Uh, in 1912, Frederick Olmsted Jr. Uh, writes a report, uh, recommendations for the green. He talks a lot about retention and care of the elm trees, which had been iconic uh, since the early 19th century. Uh, by the early 20th century, we're really suffering uh, stresses, uh, beginnings of disease and just lack of care and maintenance as well. So he talks about things like, such as um, irrigation. And he also makes a suggestion for a walkway around the edge of the lower green. If you know that sort of gravel path that walks all, goes all the way around, lined on both sides with lines of elms and uh, occasional benches to sit at, that's uh, an Olmsted design in the middle of the New Haven green. Uh, another is East Rock Park, which had been designed in the 1870s by Donald Grant Mitchell, a um, New Haven resident, uh, 
landscape designer of some renown and who coincidentally was born exactly two weeks before Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, so he's celebrating a bicentennial this year too. Um, but the, uh, in the 19 teens and 20s, the Olmsted firm worked on some expansion, adding playgrounds, uh, play fields down at the lower part of the park, um, and then a bit of engineering. Uh, the Mill River, which runs through the park, is a tidal river. Um, it can flood sometimes, and, and also when the tide is low, you get mud flats, which can be unattractive and uh, unappealing and malodorous. Um, so they actually um, built a dam at the lower end of the Mill River. You can see it uh, sort of to the right there underneath I-91, um, you know, still controlling tidal flow on the Mill River to this day. And on the right there is uh, one of the Olmsted firm drawings. So again, uh, these parks are not only just a question, these landscapes are not only a question of uh, how do you, where do you put the trees? Where do you put the shrubs? Where do you put the views? But you know, how do you create a landscape that will stand up to use by large groups of people? How would you create a landscape that will be dry and pleasant to walk on and not turn into a swamp every time it rains? How do you, you know, account for drainage and uh, circulation and just upkeep and maintenance? Um, as you're thinking about these things. So it's part of the complexity of the work of a landscape architect. Another job is the West River Memorial. How many of you, like me, were very puzzled when I first discovered this long, straight stretch of, of water on the sort of connected to the West River on the west side of New Haven. Um, Turns out that was part of an Olmsted design. You can see the design on the right with that long straight stretch uh, done in 1919 or so. And when you look at some of the renderings uh, at the bottom there, you can see the long stretch and something at the very end by the red arrow turns out to be an obelisk. Uh, this was going to be a World War I memorial. Um, and they dug the canal. Uh, and work stopped at that point. Um, and, and New Haven's World War I Memorial is the much more affordable flagpole on the green now. Uh, so, but, you know, and not only that, but this canal lines up directly with uh, West Rock. So it's pointed right at it, taking advantage of creating that, that very defined view that Jenny talked about. Um, and again, uh, the idea of an obelisk at the end of a long, narrow body of water. How many of you have been to the Washington Monument, the tidal basin, not tidal basin, the reflecting pool in Washington, D.C.? Um, clearly, that was, that was something that was created by the Macmillan Commission that Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. worked on. So uh, there's, some, there's some connections going on there as well. Um, another park quickly, East Shore Park on, on the East Shore and the, along the harbor front, uh, more provisions for active recreation. But in addition to the park itself, there was a proposal for a long entry boulevard to connect it all the way up to Forbes Avenue. Um, you can see the Olmsted plan. In the middle is a New Haven visitor's map from about 1930. Um, showing the proposed East Shore Parkway sort of laid over the street grid. Um, again, that parkway was never built, but you can stand at the park entryway and look more up along the line there for a little bit. And again, lining up with East Rock this time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's that idea of creating, creating an extension of the, of the park itself into the city so that you would have had this wide, roadway lined with rows of trees on either side so that it's not just park and city but, but sort of park penetrating into city. And the last one, um, Jenny showed you some pictures from the Beacon Falls Rubber Shoe Company, a factory um, that wanted to provide more housing for its workers um, and brought in the Olmsted firm. Here you can see the factory in Main Street uh, down at the bottom of the picture, and then the cluster of housing. It's a little hard to tell from the photograph, but that's up on top of a hill, uh, looking down on the factory. It was an area that um, it had been difficult to develop before 
the Olmsteads came in just because there was that steep hill to get up and unimaginative pre-Olmstead developers wanted to build a straight road going up at you know, that kind of an angle. Um, but the Olmsteads brought in curved roads, partly just to provide a more gentle climb up the hill, but also to provide a sense of variety and a sort of sense of movement and, and attractiveness into the community itself, the village-like feel that Jenny talked about. So you've got curving roads again that are, that are sort of inviting you to see what's around the next bend. Um, a lot, very often they'll have these uh, little triangles at intersections so that you're going gently off in one direction or another rather than stopping and making a right angle turn. And uh, those would originally have been uh, intended to have plantings in them as well to, to add some greenery and some attractiveness to the community. Um, because it's hilly topography, some places to get the grades right, they had to build uh, retaining walls to hold up the land on either side. Uh, and they use these sort of field stone. So again, it blends in with the natural landscape. Um, and, and even some of the houses, these are kind of standard arts and crafts bungalows, but uh, the Olmsted firm actually provided drawings, sample drawings of colonial revival style houses that they might build there. And they use a lot of trellises and pergolas and things. So again, you can have plants growing up the house to help tie them into the landscape. So those are some of the sites we've looked at. Um, and to sort of go back then and look at some of the common themes among them. Uh, the first one always with Olmsted is, Frederick Olmsted is scenery. Um, he sees it as an essential adjunct for human existence. Uh, the experience of nature provides refreshment, revitalization, uh, especially as an escape from, from city life. Uh, and as I said, it operates subconsciously on you. This is an idea he gets from Hartford theologian, Horace Bushnell. Uh, the idea of a sub unconscious influence. Bushnell wrote an essay on that title um, that talked about how we, we absorb things without thinking about them sometimes. And, and Olmsted clearly talks about how this works in terms of landscape. Um, <clears throat> a second one is the genius of the place. This is a term that uh, was originated by 18th century landscape gardeners in England, whose works Olmsted read, which talks about, you know, looking at the essential character of a place and trying to enhance and, and build on that rather than, you know, turn a mountain into a plain or a plain into a mountain or something. So, you know, taking advantage of, of having that view to West Rock as a way of orienting your very formal memorial canal. Um, it, and in a sense, this sort of fits in with modern ideas of sustainability, where we want to work with nature rather than against it for pr projects that will, that will hold up, that will uh, not require this eternal uh, maintenance to keep from falling back into an undesired state. Movement is important in most Olmsted landscapes. The idea is that you're not just going to sit still in them, but you're going to move around. You're going to get changing views and vistas. So that gives you a sense of richness. Uh, it provides a sort of an impetus to exercise, at least, you know, at least the, the basic level of exercise where you're, you're, you're walking and you're pausing and you're turning and you're, you're, you're moving, you're not just sitting still. Um, but that means that you, you get a variety of views and vistas and um, it's created to really draw you, to, to encourage this kind of movement that Olmsted talks about. <laughs> Key to each landscape is that it has a purpose and an idea and is designed as a totality to meet that purpose or to express that idea. Um, Olmsted doesn't choose plants for you to say, oh, wow, look at that amazing katsura tree. Look at that amazing uh, swath of geraniums or something. That they, the, the plants aren't there for their own sake. They're there to give a larger impression, to make a larger impact on you as a part of a totality of a landscape so that in fact, you, you'll see relatively few purely decorative 
plantings. Um, that you know, they very often they'll, they'll go, they'll look more for the sort of pastoral open spaces. Um, later on, the firm will be asked more often to design flower gardens, say. Frederick Law Olmsted himself didn't like doing flower gardens. He would try to sort of hide them away or put them in a very um, focused, uh, closed off sort of space rather than something that you would see from a house or from a landscape because it's hard to keep a flower garden going all year round. Uh, you know, and, and when it's down season, then you've got this sort of bare, unattractive area. And, and that's not his idea of what nature is for. Nature is not for growing little pots of flowers or Victorian carpet bedding. You know, it's, it's for refreshment, it's for scenery as he talks about it. And then the last idea and the most important one really is the idea of service. It's the common thread that runs through all the different professions that Frederick Law Olmsted tried out before he really became a landscape architect. He was a journalist, he was a farmer, he was the director of the Sanitary Commission during the Civil War, he was a publisher, he was an author, um, you know, and, and none of those quite worked for him that all of them fed into the landscape design in the end, but all of them were also felt uh, built around, uh, well, as he wrote in 1846, he's 24 years old, I want to make myself useful in the world, uh, to make others happy, to help advance the condition of society. Um, and so that's what makes his landscapes important, I think, is that they're, they're really part of trying to make the world a better place. Um, and to preserve them, to continue that purpose is, is an important thing for us to do as well today. So those are some of the Homestead Landscapes, thank you all for your attention and um, we can sign up some questions. <laughs>